as I mentioned, there are two systems that are available on the market. One is um, the BrainPath from Nico. One is the Vicor. Uh, the BrainPath is the one that I choose to use. And there are a couple of things to just sort of talk about the general setup. So this is a port that's going to be used for a transsulcal, transcortical approach to a subcortical target that can either be intraparenchymal or it might even be uh, intraventricular. The outer diameter of the typical working channel on these is, and I'm going to do this without breaking it, I promise, is 13 and a half millimeters. Okay, so it's not a ton of room. You can get a bipolar down it and open and close, but it is dependent on the length of the tube. Right, so this is a 60, and that's the next one up is 75. So you go from this to another, you know, millimeter or centimeter and a half, it becomes increasingly difficult to get your bipolar open and where you need it to go. And that's my comment earlier about trying to limit to 75 millimeters or less. So the blue part is reusable, and it's designed to either be used with a navigation frame that goes on the port, or, um, you have a pointer, thanks. Or any of the regular other navigation systems, there's a port down the middle with a locking point, and I'll go over that a little bit more when I demo it on the Medtronic system. Um, the other thing is, is that all these systems, you want to navigate the tip, you want to know where the tip is, and uh, if you're going into the ventricle, things are pretty straightforward. If you're trying to hit a subcortical target, uh, there's sort of two schools of thought. One is to come in and have the tip sitting right on your target, and then you advance the port just a little bit down to there, pull the port out, and you'll be working through a small cortical cuff of white matter when you do that. And that's probably a really good way to start if you're going for an intraparenchymal lesion, because that's similar to what you would experience with a microscope, is that you're dissecting through normal, 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 and then you get to abnormal. And it makes it much easier to recognize that transition and keep situational awareness and do an extracapsular dissection, as Eduardo was mentioning and Professor Rebus was mentioning earlier today, especially if you're talking about a glioma, trying to stay on the outside of a subcortical glioma. Uh, the other sort of more advanced technique, and it's more useful for softer lesions, is if this is the surface of the target, is to actually dock in the middle of it. Now, the advantage there is that you've got all the intracranial pressure driving this lesion out. So as you core it out from the inside, it's being delivered into your working space. The disadvantage is that you have no situational awareness. So you have to rely exclusively on two things. Well, three. One is your navigation. And if your navigation is off for a small subcortical target, you may end up here as opposed to on target, and you pull it out and you're just looking at normal white matter. So one thing that comes into play there is ultrasound, which we'll see over on the other station. The other is just your ability to recognize normal subcortical tissues from pathologic subcortical tissues. So um, typically, uh, you're going to have an MRI. It may or may not be merged with CT. It may or may not include DTI. Later on, we'll load a case that I did earlier this week. I'll demonstrate some of the planning features and DTI features so you can see those real time. Um, in this system, one of the things I like about it is that when the trocar comes out, you're still tracking and navigating your port. So you get real time feedback. And you can see in the picture-in-picture picture up here, you get real-time feedback of where you are, even without this and a pointer in there, okay? So typically, um, there's two options. One is you can freehand it or have an assistant kind of hold it and stabilize it. And similar to tubes in the spine, you know, tubes in the spine, once you're subfascial, they don't move drastically. They'll move subtly, but they don't move drastically. Same thing here. Once you're sub-peel, subcortical, these tubes don't move dramatically. So you can let them free float and do minor course corrections. If you want a more rigid stabilization, 
Um, there is a hook called a shepherd's crook that locks in. This spins freely so that there's always a little bit of freedom in the system. So as the brain pulsates, it's not a rigid retractor that's anchored to the table. So you don't have brain pulsating against a fixed thing. It will float with the brain in and out a little bit. Um, and then this can lock into a Buddy Halo or a Greenberg or a Roten Merritt's retractor, whichever system you want to use. So for the purposes of the demo at the moment, I'm going to freehand it. I'll be set up to um, uh, retract if I need to. And I'm going to go through some other stuff later. But for right now, this is no different than trying to line up trajectory for uh, doing a biopsy. So what I'm looking at right now is the upper left corner, which is give, giving me a trajectory view, and you're just lining up your crosshairs. And you can see we're losing, oh, I think we're losing it because of that. Camera's over there, got it. Now, Cora, for a minute, can you um, give me full screen on nav? Just for a moment, be ready to switch it back. Thanks. So one of the other things that's built into this software that doesn't exist in some of the other ones is if you look on the lower two panels, you'll see orange lines that are arcing out from my engagement point. And those are based on what I've told it my approximate craniotomy size is. So based on that keyhole, it'll tell me how far an excursion I can make with the port realistically before a collision. Okay, so here I am on track, on target, and I'm drifting significantly. There we are. We're not quite locked in as rigid as we normally would be. There we go. And it's telling me my distance to target. And then when my, the tip of my trocar gets to target, it switches. It says advanced cannula. Right? So I don't want to dissect anymore with the trocar. All I want to do is drop my cannula down just a little bit to target as I remove it. Now, um, this uh, Eduardo Ribas said, how come it doesn't suck brain out when you pull the trocar out like a syringe would? And the reason is, is that this hole, aside from accepting uh, a navigation probe, goes through and through, and then you have these side vented ports. So it's constantly equilibrating as you pull out so that you don't generate suction like you would with the plunger of a syringe. All right, and as you can see, I haven't even locked this thing in, and it's doing just fine, right? And this is true for brain or for uh, jello and gelatin in this case. So now you can see one of the nice things is that um, the system, let's go back to the full screen video. Um, it's got trackers on the camera, and it can automatically align, or I can manually do it if I want to make some corrections. And if I lose it for whatever reason, I can bring it back to port. And then as I work at my depth and I make some corrections, it will follow me in real time. So that's one of the big advantages of this over working with a microscope. Now with a microscope, it just means you have to release the clutch, either hand clutch or mouth clutch, and kind of follow along with what you're doing. Um, I don't have suction set up here, but you can kind of see the green of the grape. So there's a grape embedded right here. And you can see an example that I'm slightly off the side of it, and that's pretty typical with a firm lesion. So if this was a firm rubbery met, you may slide off the side, and that's why I said it's important to dock shallow and work through this cuff of normal matter to get down to the lesion. And then depending on what you're working on, you may just use bipolar and suction. You may want to use a microaspirator. So this is a Myriad device, which you saw in some of the videos. And it's a side cutting aspiration device. So what it does is it sucks tissue in and then there's a blade on the inside that advances so that you can uh, cut tissue. And 
So I can put that down, I can see it. I can do some suction here, get, some, get rid of some of this white matter, expose my lesion a little bit better. And obviously I'm gonna have to break this lesion up in order to get it out of there, so I gotta pierce the capsule a little bit, and then once I've pierced capsule, I can work on coring it out. I'll bring the, zoom this in a little bit. And once I set my focus, it'll autofocus. It knows the length of the tube and will autofocus at the depth of it. Yeah. What's the governor set up on the Nico? Are we at 100? Okay. So typically, you're not going to need to be all the way up at 100, but grapes turn out to be very firm tumors. So I'm not going to take it all out. You'll have a chance to play with this yourself, but you get the idea of trying to core this out. And then I often bring out my uh, dust off the old microscopic transphenoidal instruments. So the one time it's nice to have bayoneted transphenoidal instruments is working through this tube because you can use the ring dissectors, work around the capsule and deliver it in. And um, as Josh will attest to, my goal in life is to turn every operation into a pituitary surgery. Whether it's this or doing spine through a tube or doing something endonasal, um, it's, it's really all about pituitary surgery. That's kind of the, the terminal goal of all of that. So, oops. Any questions on this setup before I get over here? And this will be up for a while. Um, Core is here from Synaptive, and I think we had somebody else around from Synaptive. No? Okay. So she can walk through things with you. You can play around with it. And then we'll be using this station for Professor Rivas's demonstrations. And like I said, a little bit later when there's time, I'll show you the planning software that integrates the DTI. So if we'll go over here now. Thank you, Cora. Um, this is probably what most of you will have for the setup, and that's okay, right? Uh, part of this is, again, with that evolution and embryology, comment I made earlier, you don't want to change too many things about your procedure all at once. So if you're used to doing subcortical METs, change one thing, don't change everything. So maybe you introduce the tube, but you still got the scope and, and typical navigation, typical instruments. Or if you've never used a device like this before, use it on an open crany. Use it in lieu of Acusa so that you get used to using it. So a couple of nuances about doing this with whether it's a, a stealth or a brain lab or the striker nav or 7D. Um, this distance is 15 millimeters. From the end of the disposable port to the tip is 15 millimeters. So you need to navigate with a 15 millimeter tip offset so you know where the tip of your instrument is. Uh, this doesn't know the difference between a 10 millimeter and a 90 millimeter port to it. It's just navigating a point. So keep that in mind. And again, once we take this out, we lose our tracking ability. Okay. So same idea. You're going to set up a target, set up an entry. My rep has failed me and did not verify my instruments for me. Oh my God. All right, so you can see, same idea. When you're working with the exascope, I recommend as close to a straight up and down trajectory as possible that keeps the exascope out of your face. If you're working microscopic, where we're used to having the microscope in line, in a direct line of sight, you're gonna angle it a little bit. And so you can see that here, that we've set up an angled trajectory. And instead of the 3D, Levon, can I get a, a guidance view? Thank you. So similar, similar view, looks just like I'm doing a needle biopsy. It says I'm actually past target, so that would be where I'd start to advance the trocar or advance the port 
or track the trocar. And I can even just glance down there and see that I'm looking at, uh, I think we need to move the base a little bit closer, Sophia. Yep, and can we turn the lights on Come and come this way a little bit? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So there you go. There's your your port view, and as you can see, here's here's my real time tracking. You like you like this? There we go. As I move, I just move with it. Not that big a deal. Um, one of the things that you can do with a microscope currently that you can't do on the other system is use fluorescence. So if you want to combine this with fluorescein or ALA, you're confined to using it with a microscope, which again is not the worst thing in the world. And then same thing, same setup here. I'll just suction this out so you can see that I'm down near, down near the grape. This jello did not set quite as well as the other jello did. So there's the grape. It looks like part of it's been eaten away already. The mouse was here. But there's the grape. So I'm going to leave both of those lined up so that you can get hands on with uh, this device, there's a little dial here that allows you to spin the side port 360. You can see there's a little bit of a bend in here so that as you're going down the port, it keeps it out of the way, similar to a suction being out of your way. It's not quite as dramatic. You can't make that much of a bend in it because then the device can't work uh, as far as the guillotine goes. So the last thing is they do make, Hitachi does make uh, for the Aloka ultrasounds, a probe that's designed to go down here. So let's say um, that my navigation was off and I take the cannula out and I'm just looking at white matter. I'm just looking at mush, right? So one thing you can do is fill it with irrigation or sterile jelly. Chuck you over there, somebody over there. Okay and drop this down the port, and then look around so that you can see, I'll drop this down a little bit deeper, so you can see where the target is. You can see things converging at the depth of the probe right about there. Maybe dial the gain down just a little bit, getting a little bit of spread there. So that's another option, a nice adjunct, especially for smaller lesions, you take the trocar out, and the first thing you do is drop this down and make sure that you're directly on trajectory, that your nav wasn't off and you didn't roll off the side of it. Um, and like I said, you can do a little bit of course correction, but not a tremendous amount. So any questions about any of that? As far as the area, do you have a recommendation on setting yeah, so, so there are different hand pieces, and that's a very good point. Um, even with your foot off the pedal, there's always a little bit of gentle suction to keep the system clear so that stuff doesn't clog up in the tubing. So they make hand pieces that will fit down the working channel of an endoscope. Um, when you're working endoscopically, I would say that you want to start between 50 and 60. I never go to 100 when I'm intraventricular. Um, Typically, for something like this, I probably start about 60 to 70 and dial up and down as needed. I never start at 100 um, and then go from there. There are also different gauge hand pieces, so there are different apertures. You can go uh, 11 to 15 gauge, and then it jumps to 21 for the endoscopic applications. Any other questions or comments or thoughts, pointers? Would you, would you ever use um, so, yeah, there's no, I mean, if you don't have DTI available, uh, one of the nice things is that with all the publications that have started to come out, 
uh, with regards to doing this, there are certain standard corridors that even if you don't have DTI, you can do dead reckoning based on regular surface neuroanatomy and get an idea that that's probably a relatively safe trajectory. So there's an anterior corridor, central corridor, and a posterior corridor um, that really revolve around the SLF. That seems to be what defines a lot of these structures and then pyramidal tracks separates your central from your posterior.